Good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here. Welcome to this event. Welcome both in person here in the sanctuary and welcome online on Zoom. I can take a quick peek. Let's see. We've got uh, 18 devices logged into Zoom in addition to all of you here. And I know we've had, we've sold 50 tickets. So I know there's a number of folks who couldn't, this wasn't convenient to them, but plan to watch the, the video later. Uh, welcome as well to an ongoing conversation on how to turn toxic masculinity into healthy masculinity. Now, you can change the slide. Um, Andrew's really the expert. Uh, you know, he's the one that literally wrote the book, uh, and that'll, that'll be for sale in the, the atrium afterwards. How many of you own the book and or have, have read? Okay, great. Very good. Uh, and published with Harper One, which is a really incredible um, publisher. So, uh, we're proud of Andrew. Uh, but I think it's telling in a good way that Andrew didn't just want a, a regular solo author event, though he's done some of those as well. He really did want a conversation. He wanted to be, and we want to be clear up front that neither Andrew nor Gerard nor I have all the answers. Gerard actually does have all the answers. <laughs> but, uh, and we don't even necessarily agree with each other about everything that we agree with each other about a, a lot of things. But we're all very interested in doing what we can to shift from toxic masculinity toward healthy masculinity. And I would even really say healthy masculinities, plural because I think that's, that's really key here. There's not just one type of healthy masculinity that we're shifting toward. This evening, we'll only be able to share some highlights, but our hope is that you know, all of you will go from here to continue and expand the conversation as some of you may have already been doing, and we'll have some time at the end to, to talk about that. Uh, a few housekeeping, this is being recorded in addition to being on Zoom, so you can think about that. If anyone doesn't want to be on camera, then you may not want to come out later to be on the mic, because if you do, you will be. But just, uh, we are recording this. It'll only be shared with people who bought tickets, but just want to be uh, full disclosure. But there were some people that wanted to see that. Also, for those of you on the chat, when we get to the Q&A at the end, we're going to alternate between taking questions here and taking questions from the chat. So we'll, you'll have a chance to share there as well. Uh, this is our schedule for tonight that many people have seen, so I'm, I'm going first. I'm going to talk about many masculinities, uh, and then Gerard will be talking about stories of masculinity and fatherhood, then Andrew will be sharing some about what he's, some of the highlights from his book, Better Boys, Better Men, the new masculinity that creates greater courage and emotional resiliency. Uh, finally, we may be in conversation a little. We'll also see where the time is, because we also want to make sure we open it up and, and hear from all of you. Uh, then, the, sorry on Zoom, we cannot offer you food and wine, but if you are here in person, uh, we will also have uh, wine and cheese and crackers and various delights that will be in the atrium. Andrew will be selling books, and we're glad to, again, continue the conversation. We can also, you know, kind of go out into the courtyard. You know, those of you who may be more comfortable outside, we can do all of that. All right, so let me, let me get started. So if I could tell you uh, just one thing, and you can change the, change the slide, if I could just tell you one thing, it would be that what we need is masculinities, plural. Uh, you know, there is not just one norm that all else is a deviation from. You know, one true, pristine, platonic masculinity and everything else is a lesser deviation. I don't know if any of you, I sort of felt that way growing up in South Carolina, that sort of there was one ideal of masculinity and everything else was a deviation. And here's the thing, I tell, when I teach world religions at Frederick Community College, I tell my students this all the time, pay attention to who is trying to tell you what the definitions of words are. Because if you're not at the table when a word is being defined, or someone who's kind of defending your interests and perspectives, if you're not at the table, you might be on the menu. And there's a lot of people that have been on the menu when there's been exclusion from the table divining what masculinity is, especially when it's masculinity singular. And I have up here this book, Ma uh, Manhood in America, a Cultural History by Michael Kimmel. It's now on a fourth edition. I read it when it was in the third edition. When I was really researching masculinity a few years ago, this was one of the better books that I found out there. Andrew can tell us whether he, whether he likes uh, Kimmel or not. I just want to share with you one quote from this book. Kimmel said, in an important sense, there is only one complete unblushing male in America, and this is what that male looks like. Young, married, white, urban, northern, heterosexual, Protestant, father, college educated, fully employed, a good complexion, good weight, good height, and a recent record in sports. 
And if you, if you deviate from any, you, do you see that vigilance? You have to constantly be defending all those things, and it's exhausting and trying to do that. And, so, and anyway, and, uh, Kimball concludes, any male who fails to qualify in any one of these ways is likely to view himself, during moments at least, as unworthy, incomplete, and inferior. And then as a result, typically acts in toxic ways towards others um, around him. Uh, if you get out there into the academic literature, I'm not going to get, I love getting nerdy and academic, but I'm not, this is the nerdiest and academic I'm going to get is this one slide. And if you go out there and look at the literature, there's kind of a spectrum of how people think about all, all of this stuff. Some people are gender essentialists. Do they really think there's like men and there are women and never the twain shall meet? And there's no kind of in between or, or spectrum. I am not an essentialist. Uh, I'm also, though in general I'm pro-abolition for a lot of things, I'm actually not fully a gender abolitionist. I'm not sure we fully want to get rid of males and men and masculinity and women and females and femininity. Uh, I'm really a pluralist. I think there's just this wide, big tent that we should all just enjoy being a part of. Um, and if you just, I just, I'll just use myself as an example. Like. I'm not the biggest dude. Like, if you know, if you compare me to the football players of my high school football team, like, if that's the only model of male, but here's the other thing. I know a ton of women who are bigger, stronger, faster than me, right? Most of us are not on the extreme. We're in the messy middle. And it is, for me, incredibly liberating to just stipulate that up front that it's just a lot more fun in the messy middle. It's a lot more creative, it's a lot more fun to explore. Freedom for you to do you, and for me to do me. Does anybody know the, uh, oh, I forgot about the genderbred person, thank you, that's why we have slides. Who knows the genderbred person? Okay, just a few hands, well, I'm glad, so a lot of you don't. So I'm a huge fan of the genderbred person. This is the single best slide. I, I, I could talk for a long time about this, I'll talk very briefly. The genderbred person invites us to see that gender identity is how we think of ourselves in our head. No one else may even be aware of how we think of ourselves. Uh, that, that's in your brain. Uh, attraction is in your heart. Again, you may or may not be honest with or transparent about this, but that's attraction. You know in your heart who, you know, the heart wants what it wants, right? You know, you know who you're attracted to. Uh, expression is how you present yourself. Uh, and we could talk a lot about culture and history and how a lot of that's changed, but that's gender expression. And then sex is biological, and it's not so simple as male and female. There's intersex. Uh, uh, change the slide. And it's really a spectrum, and we could spend a ton of time uh, unpacking this, but the biggest reason I'm not a gender essentialist is it turns out when you just look out at the world, and you can, if you Google gender-bred person, it will pop right up, so if, you're, if any of you want to see this. But the, it turns out that there are people that are gender essentialists want to say that you know, if you are male, then you are attracted to women and you dress a certain way. Like they just, and it turns out that all these things are not correlated. You can be anywhere on this womanness, manness spectrum. You can be anywhere on this femininity, masculinity. You can be anywhere on this femaleness, maleness. Female, intersex, male, sexually attracted to women, female. So all of these, none of this is correlated to each other. For each of these, you can be. So you can just start to begin to see why you've seen like social media sites having like 50, 100 different things you can identify with as you try to account for all of these um, correlations. Uh, does anybody know this Canadian rock band? I was really into them in the 90s, uh, Bare Naked Ladies. Yeah, kind of a Canadian folk rock band. The song that came to mind uh, again and again when I was thinking about this presentation is the song Good Boy. Does anybody, anybody know that by Bare Naked Ladies? All right, I see only one hand. So I'm going to read you just a little bit of the lyrics. And this to me starts to talk about this sort of social constructivism and gender. They sing, when I was born, they looked at me and said, what a good boy, what a smart boy. What a strong boy. Did anybody hear any of these things that we could add to this list, right? The things that were said to us before we had a chance to figure out who we are, there's these things people project onto us. When you were born, they looked at you and said, what a good girl, what a smart girl, what a pretty girl. What if boys want to be pretty, right? What if girls want to be strong? We've got these chains hanging round our necks. People want to strangle us with them before we take our first breath. Afraid of change, afraid of staying the same. When temptation calls, we just look away. Temptation to maybe just be ourselves or to admit 
something that is uh, deviant, allegedly, from an alleged norm. And this doesn't mean becoming more conscious of these things, becoming more conscious of that spectrum of the gender red person, this does not make it easy, but it begins to make it more workable to at least begin to work with these things. Next, uh, I want to show a poem of what this looks like. So this is a poet, uh, Ruby Francisco. The older I've gotten, the more Jungian I've become. And Jung says, to pay attention to your dreams at night, to pay attention to synchronicities during the day. And when I sent out the congregation-wide email about this, I re received a reply about an, uh, just a few minutes later that our poetry group here at UUCF that meets every week, they were studying the poem I'm about to tell you about in just when I was sending out this uh, email announcing this event. I'm going to share just a piece of it um, with you. It's by a guy named Rudy Francisco. It's called The Heart and the Fist. He said, when I was six, I was taught how to throw a punch. And in the 80s, that was the anti-bullying movement, <laughs> learning how to throw a punch. I'm a child of the 80s. I can relate. I don't know about the rest of you. Uh, the first time one of my classmates took a yo mama joke a little too far, I remembered my training. So I turned his nose into a fountain. My fist became five pennies. I closed my eyes and I made a wish. I came home with bloody knuckles and it was the first piece of artwork that my family hung on the fridge. I remember staring at my hand the same way you stare at a midterm when all your answers are correct. I didn't know what class this was, but I knew I was passing. Can any of you identify with that, with being applauded and rewarded for toxic masculinity? I can. And so he continues, and isn't that what masculinity has become? A bunch of dudes afraid of their own feelings, terrified of any emotion but anger, yelling at the shadow on the wall, but still haven't realized that we're the ones standing in front of the light. You know, we're the ones blocking the light, you know? We learn how to dodge and jab. We learn how to step in before we swing. We learn that the heart is the same size as the fist. And he's going to begin to lead us through how do we exchange leading with one to leading with the other. But we keep forgetting they don't have the same functions. We keep telling each other to man the F up when we don't know what the F it even means to man up. We turn our boys into bayonets and we point them in the wrong direction, we pull their triggers, and then we just ignore all the damage that they're doing in the distance. The word repurpose. It means to take an object and give it amnesia. It means to make something forget what it's been trained to do, what many of us have been trained to do. It means to make something uh, so that we can use it for a better reason. I'm learning that this body is not a shotgun. I'm learning this body is not a pistol. I'm learning that a man is not defined by what he can destroy. A man is not defined by what he can destroy. I'm learning that a person who knows how to fight can only communicate in violence, and that shouldn't be anyone's first language. I'm learning that the only difference between a garden and a graveyard is what you choose to put in the ground. Are you going to put things in the ground that are appropriate for a graveyard or for a garden? You see, he says, once I came across a picture of a strange-looking violin. The caption said that it was made out of a rifle. And I thought to myself, someday that could be me. That rifle that had been made into a violin may be me, this little boy who had been taught how to punch as a six-year-old. Maybe something like that could happen to me. Violence to creativity, that begins to get to the heart of the matter about turning toxic masculinity to healthy masculinity. If any of you know the uh, Broadway musical Rent, one of the lines I always remember from that show is that the opposite of war is not peace, it's creation. The opposite, because war is about destruction, right? The opposite of war is not peace, it's not nothing, it's creation. What is yours uniquely to do and be? Now, I could talk for a long, long time about this. Gerard could too. Andrew could talk longer than both of us put together. Uh, but I have, uh, so if you go to frederickuu.org slash topical, I have preached three sermons, the sacred masculine, feminist masculinity, and toxic masculinities and many ma masculinities. So you're welcome to check those out. Uh, I'll begin to move toward my conclusion with this. I just preached this past Sunday on Brene Brown's new book, Atlas of the Heart. And when I think about traditional chauvinist masculinity, I sometimes think of it as the anti-Brene Brown. Living in a world terrified of vulnerability, 
You know, Brene Brown's all about be vulnerable, be transparent, share what's really going on with you. Don't be armored up, right? This chauvinist masculinity is all about a terrifying fear of vulnerability, armoring up, always having to win versus learning from your mistakes, being over-identified with your job and everything you do versus looking inside yourself and saying, who am I? What do I really want? What do I love? What about these people around me? Do I just need to dominate them or can I get curious about finding out what's going inside of them too? I'll end with this. Uh, and this has been on my, my heart and mind as well uh, in the wake of these uh, increasing uh, mass shootings. Parker Palmer has written, there are two ways for the heart to break. The first is a part, like many shards of a fragment grenade. And we've seen that in these mass shootings, right? Hearts breaking apart like a grenade and taking as many people down with you as possible. But there's another way for the heart to break. Instead of a part, it can break open in compassion, into greater capacity to hold life's inevitable tensions and, compl and, and complexities, to hold them creatively, not destructively, not feeling like you have to lash out in war, but to, but to create. Thank you. Gerard, you're next. Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me here today to speak. Um, my name is Gerard Young, member of the congregation. When, um, when I first found out that um, I was asked to participate in this event, I told my, my daughter about this. And the first thing she did was look at me, a little side eye, and she said, so are you saying that you are above toxic masculinity? To which I, I have said, um, actually, I don't think any man can ever say that they're above toxic masculinity. And she gave me the thumbs up and said, okay, you can speak. All right. <laughs> so, <laughs> I wanted to talk a little bit about the changing uh, the trajectory of a man. Changing the trajectory of a man. Um, I have a cousin, his name is Steve. Steve and I uh, are close, he's my closest cousin. Grew up together from a distance. He's in North Carolina, I grew up in Texas. And um, large family, lots of extended cousins, but he was the closest to me in age and, you know, in my mentality. But he did grow up in, you know, sur uh, in rural North Carolina, you know, southern rural, rural sensibilities. Uh, he and I were also the first ones in our family to go to college. So we shared that experience as well. But again, he went to a, um, a black, uh, historically black university, and I went to University of North Texas. Um, after a while, you know, we got to a certain point where he wanted to come visit me. So he came to Texas to come visit me in North Texas, and I was like, I'm going to take him around and show him, meet him with my friends and hang out a little bit. So I took him to a bar. You know, a, friend, a couple friends of mine said, let's meet at this one particular bar. So we go over there. And, uh, Chuck, and uh, Steve and I get there, and I introduce him. And Steve, this is my friend Chuck. This is Terry. Chuck, Terry, this is my cousin Steve. Good to meet you. We're gonna, they're going to go get a beer. Steve and I will go get a pool table. So we go get a pool table. We're talking for a little bit. And after a while, I notice Steve is getting quiet. And it turns to me, Steve's like, Gerard, is this a gay bar? <laughs> to which I said, yes, actually it is. He says, why are we here? Because Chuck and Terry said to meet him here. Are they gay? Yeah, actually, they are. Gerard, are you gay? <laughs> I'll pause right there. So just to let you know, this isn't really about, you know, sexuality or the LGBT com community in general. As much as it is about, you know, the way our culture molds young men to think about such aspects as the LGBTQ community and the way um, black men are told to react and to be within those types of communities. So when someone asks you if you're gay, you know, the typical you know, straight black male reply is a vehement, vehement hell no, you know, of course they're not gay. Uh, to which there would be also some defensiveness and you know, insults thrown about. <laughs> but um, so when, Steve, when all Steve got from me was a casual no, 
the look on his face was very, very confusing. You know, he was like, so you're not gay, but you're not insulted that I asked if you're gay. <laughs> no, it's, it's no big deal. So how did this come to be? How did I come to these friendships that he didn't understand? When I was four years old, mid-70s, uh, my dad moved us in, the te in Texas, moved us to a, a white suburb, you know, fresh off the civil rights era. And um, I remember being in preschool. And in preschool, this kid said, let's, let's arm wrestle. Okay, yeah, it sounds like fun, let's arm wrestle. We get down, we get down on, on the table and we get our hands together. And I just noticed as we're starting, the entire class has circled us and they are watching and they are chanting and they are cheering. And I noticed that none of them are cheering for me. <laughs> Not a single one is cheering for me. They're all cheering for this guy. And it occurred to me at the age of Five, you know, I understand that, I totally understand this, but it occurred to me at that moment and over time that as the black person in the school, I became the benchmark for which a lot of people were testing their manhood. Their physical manhood was tested against me. So either I was the person that they had to beat to prove they were a man, or I was the person that had to be on their team to help them win. One of the two, and that's the way it always was for years and years. June of 82, my dad took me and the family to a, a party, you know, a party of, of friends and stuff, to watch a sporting event. We're gonna watch a boxing match. That day was Larry Holmes, heavyweight boxing champion, to boxing against Jerry Cooney. And we all got together for a big party, a big party to watch this match. Why was this match so important? Because Jerry, Jerry Cooney was a white guy and everyone wanted to see if he could beat Larry Holmes. And of course, we were one of maybe three black families in the whole place. And my dad took great pleasure in taunting everybody to let them know that, you know, Larry Holmes is the champ. Going back to the arm wrestling when I was four years old, I remember going home and telling my dad about that. I'm like, hey dad, this kid wanted to arm wrestle me and you know, I felt really uncomfortable because all the kids, you know, and the only thing he wanted to know was, did you win? That's all that mattered. Did you win? I don't even know if I won or not. My brain was completely out of it. I, didn't, I wasn't even paying attention. So fast forward now to college, get to college. And I'm in Kerr Hall, I played soccer, you know, and Kerr Hall was the jock dorm, you know, so this is where all the football players, all the basketball players, they all stayed in this dorm. I played soccer, I mean, soccer's not football, I get it, but you know, that was what, that was my sport. I had a suite mate, cross, you know, adjacent to my room, you know, the, you have two rooms and they share a bathroom, so I guess your suite mate. Chuck was one of my, was my suite mate in that room next door. And Chuck's roommate was homophobic, and my roommate was racist, so he and I became good friends. <laughs> and we began to hang out quite a bit. And come to find out, over the course of that first semester, we started meeting a couple other people. Oh, uh, there's um, Robert, you know, Robert's a cool guy. Um, Twain, he's a cool guy. All these people that were not jocks. You know, some were gay, some were straight. You know, there was a couple of girls, you know, joined the group. And we became you know, a tight-knit community. All of us were not football players. All of us were not basketball players. So we got a lot of attention in the dorms as we walked through the halls and we came to the cafeteria. There was a lot of sneering. There was a lot of jeering, you know. Look at them. You know, look, look at the gay, the gay crowd. Now, for me, coming from that background of, you know, being the person that was it, the, the benchmark in which others tried to base themselves off of, this was an opportunity where I was not the person that you know, they had to try and out-masculine. You know, I became an object of, of ridicule for something that wasn't even, you know, something that I was, but because of guilty by association. So with that said, again, this is really not meant to be a tale about sexuality or the LGBT community as much as as the culture that molds young men to think certain ways about those communities. 
those people that are not that, that person, as Carl was saying, the person that is, you know, straight, male, you know, throws a certain job, does a certain, you know, sports activity, those types of things. So here we are, <laughs> back to my cousin Steve and at the gay bar, <laughs> and he asks, so what do you do if somebody hits on you? I'm like, well, Chuck told me to be sure to let them know I'm straight before they buy me a second drink. And it just sparked conversation. It was just more conversation and more conversation. And, you know, this continued over the years. I graduated college, I moved to New York. He went to grad school in, in, um, in Jersey. We continued more conversations. We got to know each other even more. And it just became a, you know, an opportunity for, oops, an opportunity for us to learn and share from each other. Now we move to today. Today, we are both middle-aged men, both married with kids. And um, we still share that bond, and we still share that, that, uh, that tie. Yeah, there's Steve right there. So my wife had um, a, a video made, a, a video of a bunch of friends basically doing a little, you know, saying happy birthday for my 50th uh, last year. And this was the video that he did for me. He brought that for me. Happy birthday, Gerard Young. T. Gerard Young, also known as Batman in some circles. I couldn't resist that. Uh, that takes me back to some of my earliest childhood memories. Um, one thing, you've been teasing me, or you started teasing me about two years ago about turning the Big Fitty. So, now that you are the Big Fitty because you decided to start teasing me on my 49th birthday, I just say welcome to the club. Um, it's been a lot of years, and and uh, it's a testament to your mom that uh, I feel like you, I know you as well, probably better, uh, as some of my cousins that were down the street because she, it seemed like you came to North Carolina every single year, at least once a year, either in the summer or for Christmas. Uh, so it felt like you, I knew you just as well as I knew uh, any of my other cousins across the street. Uh, some of the things that you introduced me to that some of my, we didn't have necessarily on Water Bridge Road were, well, Def Leppard, yeah, I don't know if that's a compliment, though. It definitely did not help me out when I got to college and I was playing. Def Leppard sort of graduated into Jane's Addiction in my college dorm. That was not necessarily appreciated, but it did teach me one thing along with a lot of other things that you did, was that being a little different, weird, or eclectic was not necessarily a bad thing. And um, I think watching you come from Dallas, big city of Dallas, and bringing some of your, I think, an expanded view on the world. You didn't even know you had an expanded view on the world when you were eight years old, but you did. And uh, I think that was something that gave me a little bit of an insight that there might be something outside of Gaston from, from you know, just hanging out with you as a kid. Uh, you also brought us commie football one year. We weren't really trying to play soccer, but I remember you trying to teach us soccer one year, one summer, but that didn't go over well either. Um, I think while you were trying to teach us, you started having an asthma attacks or something. But anyway... Um, other things, I think one thing that was great, we got to hang out as young adults when I came to Dallas to visit with you, and then obviously all the time we spent together doing the Base X years and beyond, because I think Base X actually ended a few years before you left. I can't talk about those either. Those were great years. We don't have pictures of any of this stuff. As much as I used to keep a camera in my hand, and you used to keep a camera in your hand. We have very few pictures, especially of the New York years. That's okay. They were good memories. We have pretty good memories. Um, so, yeah, um, lots of memories, lots of influence, whether you knew it or not. Hopefully you did. You know, you were talking about ideas around things that I never even thought about as a kid and as a teenager or more as a young adult. You were talking about LGBTQIA stuff when I didn't even know what LGBTQIA or A meant. 
Um, and, uh, you know, I appreciated all of that because when I did start thinking about it, I had reference points. Uh, and a lot of that was from, from you, believe it or not. So you have influenced the old guy or one of the older cousins uh, in many, many ways. I won't say they were all good, but definitely in many ways. Some of them were good. Um, but I want to say I love you. Uh, hopefully this is a, a great 50th. I know it's not the, the grand party that it could have been. You know, I would be in, in, in Maryland on the 12th if it was going to be, but that's not the year we're having. So, so hopefully this video will, will help. And Julie will have to do the editing because as one of your more verbose cousins, I don't know how to give a, a one-minute uh, video. All right. <laughs> Happy birthday, cuz. Now, <laughs> now, one of the reasons why that's so important is that, you know, he found out literally a few months before he made this video that his son, um, his son is gay. And his son felt comfortable coming out to him and being able to share that with him because his, he understood that his father was there for him, would care for him, and would be there for him in any of those, any situation. So that allowed, that created that dynamic. That childhood that we shared opened the door to allow him to have that, that relationship with his son. And so he and I also share that with we're having a child in the LGBTQ community. And we share that bond together. And I hope that this trajectory of a man being changed will help in the future. And I'm kind of coming into an end of this conversation. I'm going to stop there. Thank you. First of all, it's great to have this mask off. I'm extremely excited about that. I know that sounds really trivial, but it's not for me. Um, so um, I'm gonna pop up a screen. Um, I, just don't, I just don't trust well, with brain fog. I just, I just don't trust my brain these days. So I'm just gonna use the screen, and uh, I've got some slides um, that we're gonna, uh, we're gonna go through. So um, thank you for coming. Thank you so much for being here this evening. Um, it's, it's great to see you all. And, and I have to say, you know, it's one of the things I do that I teach is a course on masculinity over at Towson University. It's called The Changing Face of Masculinity. It's an honor seminar that I created. <clears throat> semester in, semester out, the course is filled from between 80 to 100% with young women. It speaks volumes right there, my friends. So it is, it is a real gift and a treat to be able to speak to so many men tonight. I have to tell you, it's great to see. Um, thank you so much, of course, to the Reverend Dr. Carl Gregg for all of your collaboration, your guidance, and your leadership in making this event happen. Carl has just done so much heavy lifting for this event. When you know, I reached out to him about wanting to do something around a conversation, um, I was so grateful that you were so eager um, and and I, I feel so awful that you've just done so much work. And I'm so grateful for it. More importantly, I'm grateful for it. Um, and thank you to Gerard Young for being such an integral part of this conversation tonight. Um, I want to thank my wife, Elizabeth, and my son, Makala, for being here tonight. Um, they get dragged to a lot of these talks. I know they're, they're probably very bored of them. Haven't told me yet as much, so I'm grateful for that as well. And I want to thank all of you for being here. Thank you for your interest and your curiosity around this important topic um, that really doesn't get enough traction in our larger public conversation, and it should. Because when boys and men are taught to and given permission to practice a healthier form of masculinity, we get much, much closer to the kind of just and equitable and compassionate and sustainable and less violent world that so many of us say that we want. That is why this conversation is so important. So um, as a quick side note, um, when Carl and I 
um, were trading notes back in the early spring on what we thought we would talk about. And Carl had you know, brought up the idea of having Gerard and his stories, which I thought was great. Um, I thought, you know, I can't do the same old, same old. One of the things that happens when you write a book is that you come out the other end, as you can imagine, far different than where you started, far different. You go through this crucible. And one of the things that I have done by coming out the other end of that small fire is I've been tempered in a way that you have this lens where you just, you feel like you just can't keep talking about the same thing. And so when Carl and I were talking, I thought, what do I think I, can I bring to the conversation where I'm not just repeating a lot of the same old, same old stuff that a lot of us have already heard and that I already talk about in such great detail in my book. And I kind of moved to this place by coming through the fire of having a few different things that I thought I wanted to bring to the conversation tonight that of course I hope are only helpful. One of the things um, is that, one of the things you'll discover in a few minutes is that we, you know, we can't expect boys and men, in the kind of things we've been, you've been hearing this evening, we can't expect boys and men to do this on their own. We can't, and we shouldn't. They need our support, and yes, odd as it may sound, they need our permission. Because one of the things that doesn't happen for boys and men is we don't get permission. You've heard, a, you've heard um, Carl, you've heard Gerard talking about the ideas um, behind men, you know, being with that narrow script that were basically handed, actually pre-verbal, pre by the way. I'm not gonna get into that tonight, it's in my book, but we're given this script pre-verbally before we can ever talk. We are given this script. And so, one of the things that we don't feel as ascending men and as men is unless we're around people that tell us you have permission in the safe space, we don't feel like we've got permission. And it's really important that as we raise boys and as we work with boys, we do the same thing that some of us are doing as men, we give them permission. That is a really important place to start. You have permission to speak your truth. That is no small thing. So this leads me to the focus of my brief talk, why we need to change the lar larger conversation about boys and especially men from toxic masculinity to the need for an agenda around healthy masculinity. First, I wanna get into toxic masculinity, and that's the slide, please. So one of the things that I've been struggling with ever since my book came out is you know, being on social media, which is always a struggle for anybody regardless, but being on social media, reading news headlines in my news feed, and seeing this label toxic masculinity being tossed around endlessly, and I mean endlessly as somebody who watches this stuff. This is my lens right now. This label is way too blithely overused. It dominates the conversation around men on social media, memes, article headlines in our news feeds. Far too many newspapers and magazines are lumping all maladaptive masculine behaviors as toxic masculine, but not all maladaptive masculine behaviors, I personally think, deserve to be in that camp of toxic masculine. This is highly problematic. It's reductionist, and it grossly oversimplifies so much of masculine behavior. If we feel it's necessary to use this label of toxic masculinity, then I think we should really limit it to toxic behaviors. Behaviors that don't directly threaten people's well-beings. I think, I think the toxic, when we use that label toxic masculinity, I think we should really be directing that to behaviors that directly impact or impede somebody's ability to feel safe. It threatens their well-being. Things, of course, like sexual assault, domestic violence, and as Carl touched on, one that's always on my radar as a parent, mass shootings. But I don't think that we should be using that label when we get into these, in, what I call really kind of these indirectly masculine behaviors. Things like having untreated depression and anxiety, loneliness, and the suicide epidemic facing men. It's not that these things don't affect all of us because they do, 
but they don't always affect our well-being directly, indirectly, in remove, possibly, but directly, not necessarily most of the time. And yet these are the kind of things, day in and day out, are still getting labeled in article headlines as toxic masculine behavior. So there's another reason, I think, that we need to really stop using this label so indiscriminately. We don't acknowledge or talk about the fallout from this label on boys and on those of us who, are, who identify as men. For many men, it's a shaming label. Because if we dare to publicly practice traditionally masculine behaviors, a lot of us don't speak up about this or speak up about our behaviors because we're afraid of the blowback. And then there's this. It sends messages to boys that much of their identity, which incidentally is taught by us as adults, much of their identity is problematic and it's something to be ashamed of. Keeping in mind that, you know, as we said, you know, boys are handed this script. No boy is born saying, teach me to have toxic behaviors or to at least embrace a traditional masculine script. Right? I mean, that's crazy. No boy is born with language and says, teach me these things. We force it upon them. There's no conversation. And so for boys to be hearing these things, and I heard this time and time again as I interviewed boys in high school for my book, what is so toxic about us? What is so bad about us? You know, my son, my son who's now almost 11, you know, sometimes would come home from school and say, you know, girls are wearing t-shirts, you know, you know, things like girls rule, and why aren't boys wearing these t-shirts? Well, I, I know that's a much bigger conversation, believe me, I get that, right? I get it. But the point being is that it speaks to something else that a boy, a really thoughtful boy in my book said. His name was Nico, and he was a really thoughtful middle schooler, and he said, I see girls walking around with these t-shirts saying um, the future is female. What does that mean for us? I didn't have an answer. That's a really thoughtful question. And it's actually a profound question because Nico's got a really good point. We are doing and we should continue to do a great job for girls and women, unquestionably. But what does that mean for boys and young men, especially who are coming into, to, of age in this time, who feel that they don't really have a place at the table? And this is no small thing. And a label like toxic masculinity when it's used so indiscriminately, starts to feel like a source of shame. Can I get the next slide, please? I think we need the conversation to go from carelessly tearing down all forms of masculine behavior to being more constructive and productive. We need a more thoughtful, empathetic, and contextual conversation about masculinity. Can I get the next slide after that, please? If we really want to have a conversation that helps boys and men, here's a place I think we can start. This concept of healthy masculinity. That is, the lack of it that we have and see in our culture, and how we can get boys and men to develop it and to practice it. So, can I get the next slide, please? So, I only want to focus really on two facets tonight. Um, of contemporary masculinity where I think we can really move the conversation forward and not just staying stuck in deconstructing all the time. One of them is depression in men. This is one of the biggest and most overlooked factors increasingly eroding so many men's well-being and emotional resiliency. More and more research shows that older boys and men are experiencing depression at rates nearly equal, if not equal, to females. That's a conversation within itself. The party line, of course, is that when it comes to depression, it goes untreated in so many men because they fear asking for help. That is true. We all know that. Those of us that are locked into this conversation, we know it's true. That said, there's another crucial reason that a lot of people don't realize. Most, most well, I should say many healthcare practitioners misdiagnose and underdiagnose depression in bo older boys and men because they're using dated metrics that better gauge depression in females. The kind of things we're talking about are um, ennui, lethargy, which are very common in, in a lot of young women and women. 
loss of appetite, sometimes loss of sleep. Those do affect boys and men. But there's also a lot of other common symptoms that manifest in boys and men that a lot of practitioners are missing out on. Some examples of this are greater irritability and hostile outbursts, sleep loss, unhealthy risk-taking, spending a lot more time at the gym or a lot more time at work, increased use, of course, of alcohol and drugs, no surprise there, and a lack of focus and a lack of sleep. The underdiagnosing I found out recently when I was working on an article is so common that the DSM, which is the Bible for mental health care practitioners, the DSM does not yet include these depressive symptoms that I just told you about. It's no wonder that depression in boys and men is getting grossly underdiagnosed and misdiagnosed. This is becoming an epidemic. Here the, here's the dangerous public health tale that occurs and this will sound familiar for I'm sure of quite a few of you, in untreated depression in boys and men, the loneliness epidemic, of which men, especially of all ages, are at the fore. The despair ep epidemic, which is especially true of the spiking numbers of less educated boys and men who aren't working or barely earning a livable wage. And then, of course, the suicide epidemic. Men are nearly four times as likely to commit suicide than are women. But it isn't just men. Males ages 15 to 24, that's the, the meat of high school and college, are more than three times more likely to commit suicide than are the female cohorts. And then we get to the high school focus especially. Boys ages 15 to 18, a great Australian study found. It found that the more that they conform to traditional masculine behaviors, we're not talking toxic, just traditional masculine behaviors, the greater the likelihood of suicidal thoughts. Can I get the next slide, please? And then there's this other facet that I really think we should be talking a lot more about when it comes to boys and men. Men and boys need emotional safety nets. If you look at the panoply of articles that I was talking about that scrutinize and deconstruct masculinity, this isn't something that's typically part of that conversation. And again, it should be. So I want to share with you two, uh, the stories of two men, one was a young man, another was a middle-aged man from, the, from my book, that are seemingly very disparate, but there's actually a common thread that we'll talk about in a minute that runs through both stories. The first one is Taylor. So, <clears throat> excuse me, when I interviewed Taylor, he was a senior in college, and I had actually worked with him a few years earlier when he was, I think, a sophomore. And, um, Taylor told a story about how he, when he was in high school, he was bullied on his track team, and he didn't really, really wasn't very sociable and didn't have a lot of friends even outside of the, the track team. And he was getting bullied, and he would come home, he'd shut the door to his room, turn the lights out, and he wouldn't come out until dinner time, sometimes even later. The thing that was so interesting, and this is something, again, that doesn't get talked about in Boys and Men, it's not just that he was depressed, that in and of itself is important, but it's this. He was feeling deep shame from being depressed. He was feeling deep shame from being depressed because he was being perceived in his own mind as vulnerable. Add on to that, he felt shame for feeling that he couldn't pull himself up by his own bootstraps, right? He couldn't be the rugged individualist who handles things on your own. So there was a double whammy of, of feelings of shame that, that, that exacerbated the depression even more. Sadly, he had started having suicidal ideation. So I want to switch over now to Paul. When I spoke with Paul, Paul was in his late 50s, maybe 60, middle-aged lawyer. He was divorced. And according to him, his ex-wife had spent all the savings that he had had accumulated and was barely letting him see his son because she had full custody. Paul had been living in an apartment down in uh, Richmond. Didn't realize he was depressed. He was drinking heavily every night so he could power through the loneliness. He also didn't realize how profoundly lonely he was. And he did all of this just so he could fall asleep. 
One night when all the alcohol couldn't mute all of his deeper pain and, and loneliness, he told me he broke into uncontrollable sobs for the first time, which was probably a really good thing. That, by the way, was something I heard a lot from boys in high school all the way through middle age, how incredibly empowering and shaming crying was for so many of these boys and men. Nothing seemed to console him. And then Paul did the unthinkable. He approached a vertical wooden beam in his living room and he hugged it. He hugged that vertical beam and he did this for a while. And you know what? It helped him. Paul told me the whole time I was hugging that beam, I kept thinking how low I had sunk, how pathetic this was, and yet how good it felt. Can I get the next slide, please? Despite how different Paul and Taylor were, of course, in their respective stations in life, in their life experiences, they were remarkably similar in this one common thread. They both were deeply detached emotionally from other people and from themselves. And they were also similar in one other way. They discovered that in addition to seeking help from therapy, the way out and forward was by finding emotional safety nets. For Taylor, this came in the form of Friday night gatherings in a friend's basement, where he and a bunch of guys would sit in a circle, and they took turns uh, asking questions of the group uh, that had to do with their state of mental health when it came to things like their you know, relationship with parents, home life, school, sports, dating. Everyone had to answer honestly, and they shared the response. They would pass around a TV remote control that was their microphone. For Paul, his emotional safety net came in the form of pushing himself to have more meetups with friends. Paul said this was one of the hardest things he ever had to do. As I write about in my book, so many men from their 30s and onward don't do a good job of maintaining, let alone creating, new friendships. And even if they do, they often don't support each other the way that so many of us need it, emotionally, the way that women are so good at doing. Paul couldn't do this with most of the friends that he had known for decades. But one friend, luckily, was amenable to deeper conversations with Paul that went beyond what I call the tedious trio of men talking about work, sports, and politics. And that made a difference for Paul. It helped him get over his emotional loneliness. While both Taylor and Paul talked about how helpful it was to be in therapy, they both gushed about the power of the connections they worked so hard to make with other guys. And this was so telling, they were proud of them. Once Taylor had this with the other guys, the fog, as he called it, of depression lifted. And for Paul, he was able to cut back on his drinking. He stopped hugging his beam. Unfortunately, he started hugging other people. There's another way that men are starting to find the emotional safety nets they need with mental health apps on, on smartphones, right? There are only a few right now that are geared towards men. Um, most of them aren't gender specific. But older boys and men should try the ones geared towards men, and this is why. Many users find it safer to open up with other guys who can commiserate, who can bear witness, and who can offer guidance for similar feelings and frustrations of simply just being a man. And the communities on these apps create a new sort of connection that many boys and men lack. Friendship moored in emotional trust which many of them, as many guys told me in my book, of all ages said, many of them have never had that. So many male friendships, without us ever knowing it, are built on competition. There's always that one-upsmanship. And it's always, oh, I'm just joking around, I'm just busting your chops, man. It's at, you know, that is a status increase at the other guy's expense. That erodes trust, that doesn't build trust. The common experience for so many men is we know that if some guy wants to kick my ass, my buddies have my back. But most guys don't know that when it comes to that emotional support, my buddies have my back too. And that is no small thing. 
And this is what emotional safety nets give to boys and men. So if there's anything that you take away this evening from my personal talk, I hope it's this. If we want the kind of world that is less violent, more just, more equitable, more sustainable, and that meets boys and men's needs as well, as, our, well, as, as well as our own, then we've got to take this conversation forward to how we can help them learn and practice greater emotional resiliency. Thank you so much for being here this evening. That's great. Thanks, Andrew. So that was part one. We're going to move into part two, which is hearing from you all. But we need to do a quick set change. So don't go anywhere. But if you want to just step up and stretch, just take a second to do so that. And we're going to move the screen. have a question, a comment? So Joe, can you come to this mic right over here by the piano? And you can just share something. You can uh, ask a question of all of us, of any of us, what, just anything, anything you'd like. Uh, I have both a, a comment and a question. OK, I grew up in the 50s and 60s. And I came to this country from Puerto Rico as a two-year-old, and my mother put me into a kindergarten and, uh, in kind of the white section of D.C. And uh, it's a little Puerto Rican, and I was bullied and picked on every day. And after about two months, you know, I went home. I told my mother, I said, I don't want to go back there because these boys keep hitting me. And she looked at me, and she said, well, hit them back. You know, I said, okay. So the next day I go in, and the boys try to, we were doing finger painting and they tried to push my face in the finger paint and I stood up and I hit him in the face, you say, and he went off crying and I was never bullied again. So that practice of kind of heading off the bullies, because I went to eight different schools, you know, from kindergarten, uh, from elementary school through high school. And every time a boy goes into a school, you're going to have to fit into a pecking order into how that you know, sort of manifests itself. And every time some bully's gonna come up, and I learned from kindergarten when they come up to, you know, harass you or push you around, I didn't have a conversation. I don't wanna fight this. I just hit them, you know, and it was over, you know, and then you, you found your place in the pecking order. So my question is, uh, how does that type of behavior, that type of methodology, for example, that worked for me up until high school, didn't work in the corporate world. You know, you can't do that, you know? So um, my question is, I mean, that worked, you know? And it gave me some confidence when I went into a school that, okay, I know some guy's gonna come up and do something, and I'm gonna smack him, and it's gonna be over, you know? So that's my question is, how does that dynamic sort of fit into the, the whole perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think partially, uh, thank you for sharing that. I think it, it's real. You know, it's definitely your, your experience. And part of it was what you said. It worked less in high school, and then it worked less in the, in the corporate world, right? And then I think our, uh, these days, I think there's a pretty zero tolerance policy for, for kind of violence in schools. So I think that that would be less effective these days uh, for, for one thing. And then also, I mean, part of what comes up for me is the what seeds are being planted, right? This sort of, you know, that it's, uh, and, and for you, you know, you've turned out great, Jeff. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I know where your heart is, and all, but, you know, that I wonder, though, that there's people that I think didn't ever, don't necessarily learn those lessons and that that stops learning and, and are still brawling and are still know of that as the only way and as opposed to, to talking it out or having other, but. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Other things from y'all? I'm afraid to disagree with you because I'm afraid you're going to beat the hell out of me. <laughs> so, um, uh, do you want to... Uh, Joe, you'll have to use a microphone for people at, at home. I had friends that were bullied, you know, in school, and they, they were terrified, and they didn't fight back. And the rest of their lives, they were... Like you said, shamed, they were intimidated, they were always a little fearful and anxious, you know, in some social situations and stuff like that. So the opposite had the effect. You know, in my case, I gained some confidence in terms of dealing with things. And in their case, it just the opposite happened. They lost confidence and they were, you know, a bit shy and hesitant and that sort of stuff. And uh, now that said, at the end of the day, I think that um, there's that 
uh, that, per that inner perspective that you have to be tough, that you were talking about, you gotta be tough and you can't show fear and all that sort of stuff, that I found that doesn't work either. You know, you can't play that card forever because it, it damages you because there's always somebody tougher, always somebody smarter, always somebody bigger, you know. So um, I learned that as a, as a teenager, that you know, kind of back off from that. But nonetheless, you know, that whole uh, bullying thing, it just, it, it causes huge damage. Yeah, you know, it does. And part of what I think about these kind of ethical questions like you're bringing up, I, there is absolutely a need to deal with the individual, you know, you, Joe, are dealing with this particular bully or whatever. But I also, also like to zoom out, and I think part of what we're trying to have is this larger systemic conversation that there's, there's both the question of bad apples and then there's the larger question of bad barrels. <laughs> that are creating these bad apples and, and rotting them, so that I think that's also what we're trying. We, we both need to deal with acute situations of bullying, like you're talking about, as well as look at these larger systems, these bad barrels that are creating this toxic masculinity that is, you know, for, so. So Gerard? I was gonna say, you know, I, to, to your point, a certain degree, it also comes down to the culture, you know, that, that you're within at that time. And different cultures, will allow for those types of dynamics where, while, while in other cases, that's not the case. I mean, if you go to, you know, my time frame, you know, growing up in the, in the 80s, you know, or 70s, 80s, you know, now, you know, you're looking at, I as, you know, one of maybe two black kids in the entire school, I could not do that. I can just hit a kid and it'd just be over with, you know. I, the uh, wrath of the school will come down, would come down on me. So, you know, that dynamic would not work in all situations. And so I look at, you know, I, as, as idiotic as the, the origin of the term cancel culture came from, you know, cancel culture works you know, to a certain degree. It was like, why don't they have smoking in hospitals anymore? Because cancel culture works. Why don't they, you know, have, why is there less sexual harassment in the workplace? Because cancel culture works. I mean, I mean, in those situations where the culture no longer allows for that dynamic to, to breed and dwell and grow and prosper, it, won't, it, it will go away. And when you look at toxic masculinity and you know, the, the, the toxicity that, that breeds so much in, in, in men in the past and still to this day, to, you know, to a certain degree, I feel it is you know, becoming more apparent that we are looking at it and we are paying attention, whereas, you know, 40 years ago, it was not a conversation to be had. Today, it's at least it's a conversation to be had. Yeah, uh, the last thing I just want to tag on to real quickly is that, you know, as Carl was saying, in schools, you know, the big push is for socio-emotional toolkits, which is, which is something I really didn't touch on, but that's a huge thing that, that, that is being foisted upon boys, and in a lot of ways, there is a lot of really good about that. Um, but as Gerald was alluding to, Gerard, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Gerard, I'm life sorry. Long, life long. Sorry, man, sorry. <laughs> God, thank you. As Gerard was, was alluding to, um, you know, it's different now. As Gerard was saying, it's, it's very different now. You know, you, you, yeah, you still have fights, but a lot of the bullying, of course, happens online. And that doesn't, it doesn't excuse it for one second at all. But, um, you know, it's, it's the, this idea of bullying, you know, at some point you've got to say, well, of course, we need to teach everybody to stand up for themselves. Because bullying happens to girls in spades. In fact, it probably even in some ways happens, you know, the, the things that boys are bullied for are not as much the things that girls are bullied for. And, and a lot of research shows that across the board, a lot more, probably girls are bullied more so than even boys are, and it happens relationally online, most of it. So it's not that we shouldn't teach kids to stand up for themselves, of course we should. That's part of resiliency. But as Carl was alluding to, it's a question of, you know, to what extent do you want to encourage this idea, you know, of, because the micro becomes the macro of violence. You know, it's, very, it's a very slippery slope in terms of where it begins and where it ends. And for kids whose brains have not fully developed yet, who are still very reactive, and this is true for boys well past college, you know, having that dynamic and saying you just need to like step up and, and do what you need to do and hit them back, you know, that kind of reactivity is a hard thing to rein in in boys. 
And what's, it's one of the problems we see with a lot of contact sports where we have a domination culture now. And boys don't know how to flip the switch because they're not taught that, and they're also their brains can't, aren't prepared for the long-term thinking like girls are by, say, high school or college. Boys can't flip the switch. So that would be one of my concerns, you know, in terms of this is a really important discussion, a bigger discussion about, you know, where do we draw the line, you know, with violence? So it's a great question. Hi, th thank you for this evening. It's been really um, great and stimulating. Um, I relate to Joe's story. Um, you know, when I think of my high school years, I was um, academic, I was sensitive, I cried easily, and I remember hardening myself to survive high school, um, pretending that I was someone that I wasn't so that I could survive. And not until college and later on did I start to sort of peel off those layers and find myself. Um, and I, my 16-year-old my son, unfortunately, couldn't be here today, um, but he's very much like me. Um, very sensitive, very thoughtful, writes poetry, very in touch with his emotions, also very physical, you know, does martial arts, you know, likes to be physical, but is, you know, I think sort of the epitome of healthy masculinity at his age, and every single one of his friends is a girl. You know, he does not have a community of boys. Um, you know, I don't have the community that I want yet to myself. I, I, you know, I, I think it's hard enough as a 40-year-old or a 50-year-old, um, but I wonder what your thoughts are for someone who is living that in, in, as a teen um, and is having difficulty finding their community of, of like-minded people, like-minded boys. Is it okay if I jump on yeah, no, first? Okay, thanks, guys. Okay, so um, again, another great question. Um, so when I brought up that example of Taylor, um, who was an extremely thoughtful, very academically bent, um, very sensitive young man. Um, he was able to find, um, and this is much more common now than it ever was before, um, but he was able to find a group of guys who on Friday nights were getting together in a basement and doing, doing the work in the circle, in that container that so many men's groups do so powerfully and so beautifully. Um, one of the things I talk about in, in one of the chapters, I hate to keep coming back to the book, but, but this is another thing I talk about in the book, is that, that I visited a school on the west side of Chicago, it's called, and, the, and there's a great program called Becoming a Man, BAM. And they, thank God, are taking these programs from the south side of Chicago um, into LA, into Seattle, and into Boston. They've had such success, but what they do, and this is something where the boys don't even have to find their own circle like Taylor did, but it's a class that meets once a week, and the boys are just randomly put together, and they sit and they do the, 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 kind, of men's, the kind of men's group circle. And they do a check-in, which when I was visiting was the most powerful part of it, was really the check-in. But having something like this, and I'm a huge proponent of this, I think all schools should be doing this. I think they should be doing it for boys, I think they should be doing it for girls. I think they should really be doing it, separating the two and having their circles, because I think a lot of girls need this too. But this is the kind of thing that it's a very safe container. And, and for instance, I remember on the day that I was there, there was a boy that was you know, sitting there. He was like very disaffected. He was sitting there. You could tell he, he was not buying any of this. And they'd been doing this all year long, but he was having, clearly, he was in a rough patch. And at, very, at the very end of the circle, he spoke up and he said, you know, I'm like failing all my classes, man. I, I, don't, even, I don't care about any of this stuff. He said, but, and he said, and he, he just kind of sat there, and, he, and then he leaned forward, and he said, but the reason I keep coming here is because of you guys. You guys keep me coming into school. So I hear you guys talking about how it's working for you, so I guess I need to keep trying a little bit harder. The point of that is that what had been created in that circle throughout that year was literally bullying and, and mooring this, this young man. It was keeping him checked in. So there, we, you know, when I was talking about the importance of, you know, boys and men need a safe place where they can get emotional commiseration, support, um, you know, bearing witness, sometimes guidance. But these are the kind of things I really think, I'm, I'm hoping, and I really think more schools need. Um, you know, and possibly through, I don't know, I mean, your son takes, he takes a martial art, right? And, that, and that, you know, that's the kind of place um, that I think that you, you know, maybe, I don't know if you could maybe ask, you know, whoever runs the studio, but 
um, I forgot the term, but, but talk to that person and see if there are, you know, if it's something that maybe he'd be willing, he or she'd be willing to put together um, where, where there could be, you know, maybe in their circle when they sit down at some point where they could do some of this kind of work. Because it's, it's amazing, you know, boys will talk. Most of us think boys won't talk, they will. When boys feel safe and they feel that, that, that you will talk about what they want to talk about, they will meet you there. So I do think, I do think there are ways to do this. Um, it's hard to do on your own. It's hard, really hard to do on your own at this age. But I think maybe by talking to, you know, at, at the martial arts studio um, and asking him if he just even has a couple friends that maybe they could, they could sit down and just kind of, you know, sit down and, and you know, get away from it all physically and just kind of talk about these things away from the remove of the peer pressure. So, you guys? See if Sensei can help, right? So, um, Karate Kid. The other piece I wanted to pick up on from what Owen was saying is I shared earlier about uh, the Bare Naked Lady song, Good Boy. I'll give a shout out just to one more song, which is uh, Dar Williams has a powerful song called When I Was a Boy. And, you know, it kind of gets to what Owen was saying about watching how he saw this in himself and he may see some of this in his son, this kind of shutting down and, and you know, turn it off like a light switch, this, the, these pieces of yourself. And I, I won't tell the whole story of the Dar Williams song, but it, it, it essentially is her as a, as a woman confessing to her husband, telling these stories of when I was a boy, you know, telling of, of being a tomboy you know, doing all these things, being able to run around with her shirt off and not have, and she talks about the time when all of a sudden it became a problem for her to have her shirt off, right? So she tells all these stories and finally at the end she sort of confesses defeat that of, of ha having lost access to these boy parts of her. And then the, end, the kind of flip of the song is her husband sharing, there was a time when I was a girl, when I could be really close to my mom and I could cry easily. And I mean, it's just, a, it's a very, very powerful song of telling, of, of noticing how these, these dynamics, what, what do we let flow in ourselves and what do we tamp off and what do we repress? Gerard, anything you wanted to add to what Owen was saying? So I was just thinking about in terms of my daughter has her group of friends in, in, in middle school and it's about five, six of them. And there's this one boy, you know, that's in their, in their group and he's, He's tight with them, and you know that's that's his group, you know. And it really doesn't matter, you know, the gender that you know that they are. Um, Thomas is just hey, Thomas is Thomas, you know. He's just he's just part of the group. And I'm sitting here, you know. They came to me this past weekend, and they're like, hey, we want to do a sleepover. Thomas wants to come over. I'm like, oh, Thomas is coming over for a sleepover? Oh, oh. So now my now my my brain is turning over, and I'm. And, I'm having to re readjust and rethink about how I think about those, you know, that dynamic within myself as well. Dr. Geller uh, Reiner, in early in your talk, you t you talked about how this begins before the verbal stage, when whatever the gender of the child, they're very close to their mother. So, what role do you think women play in teaching that? any kind of role model for masculinity. And um, surely we, we do play a role in this. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question. Be careful, please. I'm glad you asked that question because I think it's such an important topic, the idea of um, what one of these researchers emailed me and he said the manning up begins in the cradle before language. And I thought that was so powerful. Um, and it does. And, and yes, you're absolutely right that, that typically um, mothers do play a defining role, right? It's not a coincidence. This is, you know, it, it, it guts me to say this, but, you know, it's not a coincidence that you read so often, you know, or you watch documentaries or you read so often about wars that these young men who are dying are yelling out for their mothers. That speaks volumes. And so there is a special bond, absolutely that, you know, that sons especially do get from their mothers in terms of that connection. And, and Carl was talking about that in terms of that Dar Williams song. Um, you know, so many boys and, and men have, have a very special connection with their moms especially. You know, it's, I don't think it's a coincidence. I've thought about this a lot. Why so many men are so quick to throw punches and to get really reactive and hostile when someone ever says anything about their mothers. 
If they, if they, if they, if they say something that, that is like some kind of, you know, you know, making, making, seeing something that's making their mothers look bad, or they're, they're ragging on a guy, and they're saying something about his mother. Some guys will do this with their, about their wives. I don't think it's a coincidence, because when boys, and then eventually men, need to open up, the place that they feel often safest that they can do it is with girls, and then eventually women, who are friends, or partners, or spouses. So often, boys and men will find that safe place with girls or women. That said, I just want to say this one other thing. That said, the researcher who wrote that the manning up begins in the cradle did some fascinating research. His name is Edward Tronick. And he's a psychologist, and he's done this neonatal research for, since the 70s. And with the, with, he's always done this thing called the still face paradigm, where the mother will sit on a stool opposite the infant, and the mother will be engaging with the infant, and then the mother will, by, by design, pick up and leave. So she is gone from the infant. And then, of course, the researchers will gauge how the infants react. And then the, when the mother comes back, the researchers will gauge in the still face paradigm, uh, the face-to-face -face paradigm, how the, the baby is then reacting to the mother when the mother comes back. And one of the things, to speak to your point, was that um, when the mothers would um, come back and, and she would sit there, and they wouldn't engage, have a kind of a stoic face with the sons, they, got, they were much more likely to cry. They were much more likely to get irritable. They were much more likely to get fussy. They would reach for their mothers to the point of almost coming out of their chairs. And it's not that the girls didn't do this, but time and time again, decade in, decade out, it was the boys doing this. But this is the interesting wrinkle, is that often afterwards, when they would have what the researcher called this reunion period, the mothers were more likely to engage more readily with the daughters than they were with the sons. And what's so telling about that is that's the manning up. It's this idea that if you're going to get this emotional, you're going to get this irritable, this is not something that I can encourage. And this is not conscious. But this is very much something that even mothers are teaching their sons. It's not that they're bad mothers. That's not the message at all. I'm sure a lot of them are wonderful mothers. The point is, is that this is so, it, it pervades our culture and many cultures so much. It's this idea that if you're gonna be a competent man, I've gotta start raising you. The idea of a competent man is you can't be soft. You can't be too emotive. And that this is me hardening you up. That's when it begins, pre-language. Before a boy has language, the infant boys in the, in the studies for decades have had language. The mother is sending the message which is a very profound message that neither one of them are even aware of, of course. But it's that message of you need to learn to, you need to, learn to, to, de to really dial it back. If you want me to engage with you, if you want the response that you desire, you need to dial it back. And this is the kind of thing where it starts. That said, it's far more likely, all the research shows, even though mothers do contribute to this to some extent, it's far more likely that fathers are going to be the torchbearers of this kind of behavior throughout boys' lives, much more so than mothers. Yeah. Oh, we've got, we'll go right here tonight. We have one, one Zoom comment. We have a, a member of the UU uh, Church of Hagerstown, so just a little bit away, uh, just come at Leighton Scott, uh, said that he actually wrote a book in 92 on the search for manhood, so was glad to see some updates in, in your book, and said, just shared one quote from the forward of his book that with all the attention on men's problems, you would think that men are the most understood of today's sexes, but it's just not true. Like there's just so much more understanding to be done to really see what's, what's really happening with men. So thank you for that comment. Yes. Thank you. Um, this is more a comment than really a question. Thank you for writing a book like this. I am an only child, no brothers. My dad was kind and loving, but kind of removed. All my cousins were women. My career was in a field which was mostly women. My first child was a daughter. And then I found out I was pregnant with a boy. Uh, a what? <laughs> I had worked in daycare. I'd seen little boys. Uh, I had a minor in early childhood education. Boys were so large motor. I mean, oh my God, they were always getting in trouble and knocking things over. I had no idea how to mother a boy. And so I got some books. <laughs> uh -huh. 
and I think they helped a lot because my boys are great people now. And the one that's going to be a lawyer actually wants to smash the patriarchy. So <laughs> I think I did an okay job. But thank you for continuing. You know, the books I read were in the 90s when they were born. But thank you for continuing to address this and write these books and give these lectures. I appreciate it very much as a woman, as a mom, you know, who had no idea what boys were about. So thank you. Thank you. That means a lot. Thank you so very much, truly. Thank you. Keep doing the, keep doing the great job that you're clearly doing. Hi. I want to thank you guys. Uh, this is uh, a topic tonight really close to my heart. Um, I'm a therapist here in Frederick and uh, uh, have a couple of men's groups that I run with my colleague Zach Mooney. And um, I didn't come here to plug that, uh, but I did want to bring up a topic that uh, I feel is very wrapped up in masculinity. Um, I also run the Male Survivors of Sexual Abuse group for Hartley House and uh, may come as a surprise for some people that Hartley House supports men um, because I know they're so well known for supporting women and providing shelter, but um, it's a, a wonderfully supportive program. Uh, I've been running the Men's Survivors Group for, for five years plus now, and um, I think that masculinity is such an integral part of um, the struggle for male survivors. Um, the average, average uh, period of time for disclosure of male sexual abuse is 20 years. And uh, that's the average, and masculinity is all wrapped up in that secrecy. Uh, one in six men are sexually abused, and uh, I just thought I had to get up and speak to that because of our last question from our online viewer about, you know, uh, men and masculinity not being explored, and that is an area that is, uh, is very much in need of being explored, so I, I wanted to speak to that for just a moment. And if you guys want to say anything about that, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, I just want to say, before anybody says anything, thank you so much, because that is such an important topic that is becoming more and more um, uh, something we've seen because of, for instance, in countries, in, in a lot of African countries, where there's been a lot of civil war, and a lot, a lot of men are being raped. And, that, and, and so it's not just, it's, you know, God knows it's bad enough they're raping you know, women, but in some African countries, a lot of men, there have been really powerful um, articles about this, a lot of African, in some African countries, men are being raped as well, soldiers, enemies. Um, but this is something that is finally, finally, slowly, like you said, coming to the fore, so thank you. Do either of you guys want to take on that one? I was gonna say, I forgot if it was Carl, if it was Andrew, but they were saying before about, about shame, you know? And when you speak of the 20 years that it takes to you know, the, to come to light, you know, what, you know, what you've endured, you know, it's based on the shame, the shame that, you know, that the individual is holding within themselves. And, you know, that, that's a sad, that's a sad take on, 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 on the culture. And, and want to just underscore what you said about Hartley House, that just to know that that resource is out there, yeah. that it is not only is a tremendous support for domestic violence for women, but it is also a support for men. So thank, thank you for mentioning that in our community. And we're, we're, we're at time, so I, I want to share one last comment from online and any final comments. And then for, for those of you that wanted to ask questions, know that we're going to be hanging out. Let's continue. The, so let's, let's hang out and continue the, the conversation. Uh, and there'll be um, food and drink and all of that. So this is a final comment from online since they can't hang out. We're about to end the Zoom momentarily. Uh, so from Randall Edwards, we get, when fathers harden up their sons, indoctrinating them to the cultural norms of masculinity, can it also be because there is concern about how their son's masculinity will be in some ways a reflection of their own? So this is kind of the, the flip of Mary's question about mothers. And I would just say, at least to me, yes, and what this part of the, what this underscores and it's related to the shame piece, I think, is the need for, for fathers and for men to do their work, right? That what each of us can at least do is our own work to deconstruct masculinity and to embrace the healthy masculinity so that, you know, just like, you know, you doing your work had these ripple effects, right, for your cousin and now for his son and, and the, so that that's something we can do. But any final comments from either of you? Well, I was just gonna, going back to uh, my example of my dad, you know, with the arm wrestling, where 
you know, I was trying to share with him my discomfort with the situation where all he wanted to know was, did I win? You know, that was, that was his core component of what, I mean, he was army, you know, that, that was where he came from. So, you know, that dynamic, you know, was, one of my favorite quotes from, from um, President Obama is, the default position is inertia. You know, so if you don't do something to change, again, changing the trajectory of, of a person or a dynamic or a culture, it will continue in the same path. And I, I just wanted to add on to what Gerard just said that, you know, that, and what Carl was saying, the idea that it really is, <clears throat> well, and, and I guess I want to thank the, you know, um, the gentleman for, for writing that in. It really is, so much of it is, is, is the mirror to the father. You know, and it's this idea that, you know, you are a mirror image of me, and I'm failing you, and I'm failing myself if I don't raise you and harden you so that you are not going to be a punk. You're not going to walk around with a, with a target on your back. You know, real quickly, I'll just add on that my own father um, was an incredibly conflicted man. I think a lot of men can identify with this. My father was a very conflicted man. He was a holy terror around the house, wicked, wicked temper, and just, it was just minefields everywhere. That said, my father, my mother was very loving, but she wasn't as loving as my father in a different way could be. He was incredibly nurturing and affectionate with me, far more actually than my mother was a lot of the time. But it was rare, it was withheld, it was conditional, but he was, my father, loved the sensitivity that he saw in me, and he often would even tell me that. And yet, as I got older, and he still would occasionally want to see that sensitivity from me, you know, he also was making sure that, you know, if we come home, if we came home, I shouldn't say we, I, I was the only one that got in fights, but if, if I came home, you know, I got in a fight, you know, he wouldn't say to me, did you win? But, you know, he, he, it, he wasn't dissuading me from getting into fights. You know, when, you know, he always would say to me, you know, if anybody brings up religion, you know, you know, punch them in the nose. No questions, no talking, just punch them in the nose. So it's just, it's things like this, really kind of things that just sound so harebrained to us. But I think a lot of fathers, not all fathers, but a lot of fathers really are conflicted. And their fear is, yes, it's a reflection on them. I think that's a big part of it. But a lot of fathers, especially today, also want their sons to be good, sensitive, caring men but they also don't want them walking around in this age of just excruciatingly gross bullying. They don't want them to have targets on their back. It's, it's, a, very, it's a very difficult thing to navigate. It's something I navigate as a father of, of, of a boy who's gonna be 11 years old. That's great. Yeah, I mean, so I would sort of close with a, picking up both on what Andrew said as well as um, Gerard's quote about inertia, that I promise you one thing is true. Our system is perfectly designed to get the results we're getting. Like, we are perfectly designed to get the results we're currently getting, which is a dumpster fire, <laughs> you know, in our society. And so what we're hoping this is a conversation encouraging is to make some shifts out there to do our work, both individually and, and together, to, to make a shift toward, toward healthy masculinity. Uh, so, again, thank you all for being here. Thank you for being here online. The Zoom um, will end momentarily, but you all, please hang out. You're welcome to, you know, get some food, get some drink. We have both wine as well as non-alcoholic options. Uh, you're welcome to enjoy the courtyard. We have an art exhibit. Um, so just hang out. Let's continue the conversation. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for all those questions.